All right, uh, our next speaker is Stefano Rivera, who he works at um, Yola. He was on our panel earlier about um, running Python in production. He's also a, a Debian developer, as, um, as well as the maintainer of the PyPy package on Debian, and he's going to tell us about the road to continuous deployment. Thank you. Um, so I've been thinking about this stuff for a while, because the first project I had when I got to YOLO was replacing two horrible deployment systems with a new one that I had to write. Um, we mostly got there, and the fact that I spend very little time on it these days, I think, means things are good. Um, <laughs> I want to talk about the kind of why we took some of the choices we took and why you would why you would want to make these choices or why they would be bad choices for you. Um, some, yeah, and walk through some examples. Um, I'm afraid the slides aren't as pretty as they could be. If I ever give this a talk again, I'll put some more effort into them. Uh, so, really, before we can talk about deployment, we need to talk about what our apps are doing. Where, how are we running them? How are we getting requests to them if they're web apps? This will tell us how we should be putting these things on servers. So your typical web app has a bunch of front-end apps, let's say they're Django, and a central database at some point. And you can create and throw away front-ends because all the state is in the central database. Um, if you're in the microservice world, you might have lots of these things that are talking to each other. Maybe you've got front-end apps that talk to microservices that talk to databases. And the front-end apps don't actually need a database at all, but the um, services do. Or maybe the front-ends do need databases. Um, if you're a bit further along, you've probably got a lot of background workers doing asynchronous stuff. Very similar, in this case you've got a queuing system rather than a database, but it's still kind of throwaway code with centralized state. So if you're doing something like that, you're probably load balancing incoming requests, and the easiest way to do that is with is what you would always do on your edge, client-side load balancing. You use something like an HA proxy or an Nginx to route re incoming requests to one of multiple servers running your code that will uh, handle them. Um, and you're exposing this either as a single IP address that all the requests come in on, or some host name for a service, or some other kind of um, service discovery database. Another approach which big companies like Facebook's and Google's use is not to load balance all their internal requests, but to make the clients intelligent. So when a client wants to request something, it asks the internal service discovery system where it can find that service. It tries to get a response from it, but it can't get it. It tries another one. Maybe it then escalates a problem to say it didn't find the service and gives up and does something useful. Um, this has the advantage of not needing to route all your requests through a single point of failure, but it makes it far harder to write clients. We didn't go down that route because we're small enough that that isn't a problem we need to solve. Um, then we've got different environments that we're running our apps on. You've probably got a production environment. You've probably got production-like environments that aren't quite production. It's really nice that developers can work on their own machines without having to work in VMs. So you probably want your application to be able to run standalone with Python. This should be fairly straightforward. And if you like us, you've got integration environments that developers can spin up and down when they want to test things. So an integration environment is like production in that it's got everything, but let's say it's all on one machine and can be created in half an hour and thrown away whenever you've done with it. Um, in, in the situation of QA and integration, there's probably no redundancy. This is a single version of each app. In production, you probably want redundancy because things fail. Chances are you're storing your code in Git or something. Probably got a build system. Maybe you don't if you think you're pure, pure Python and you're using fab and you don't quite understand why people would have a build system. That makes a lot of sense if you're small, but as you get bigger, you're probably going to want to do some stuff at build time, like minified JavaScript and images and compile things. Then you've got to get it onto your code, I mean onto your machines, deploy it somehow, and you're done. Um, let's talk about configuration. So the way I see it, when you're deploying code to a server, it should be the same code. Hmm. When you're QAing code, you want to QA the same code that you're going to put into production. So the same built artifact that you put on your QA environment should be the thing that goes to production. 
But it probably needs to do different things, like talk to different databases and different services. So it needs some configuration to tell it how it should behave differently. Um, this was the first problem we tackled, and I think out of everything we did, this was the cleanest and best thought out part of the system. Um, what do our apps need to know? In production, they probably have to talk to load balancers. They probably got real workers. They've got all sorts of third parties that you can't talk to in your QA environment because they don't have sandboxes and you, everything you do with them is going to be built. In your QA environment, things are probably a little more simple. So maybe there's no redundancy. I think I've already covered that kind of thing. Your integration environment, when everything is on one machine, you can't use the same port for more than once, so you need some kind of de-hosting mechanism. Um, we found ourselves very RAM constrained in our integration environment. We like to run them on EC2 instances, on the, um, the large type EC2 instances, which only have a couple of gigabytes of RAM. If you want to run all your apps in there, it's a little bit tight. And maybe you don't have any background workers, or you've only got one worker for each type of task. For QA, you probably don't have any workers. No, sorry, for local development, you probably don't have any workers. You're probably using a SQLite because who wants to run Postgres on their laptop? Um, and when you're developing an app locally, you probably want to be able to run it against different things. It's really useful to be able to make your, if you're working on a front end, to make it talk to the production services if you're trying to debug a problem that's only happened to one user in production. You're not quite sure what's going on, but to use, if you just made the API request, you could make it work. So it's nice to be able to configure your local development against production or QA or your integration environment, depending on what you're doing. Most of the time, you would not do that against production because that's just asking to create trouble. But every now and then, it's useful. Um, you also, of course, want your local development to be as easy to set up as possible. New employees should be able to get set up on the first day and be committing code if you're doing things correctly. And yeah, they're going to have to somehow get all the dependencies that your app has. If it's got complex dependencies like queuing systems, either it should talk to something on a faraway environment or, it sh or you should make it easy for them to set it up. Hmm. So what do you need to know when, you can, when you're configuring something? Where to find things, what databases it's using, and, what, and all the secrets it needs to make communication happen. And some other stuff like maybe debug modes on or off, maybe talking to this third party is on or off. There's things you want to configure. Um, these should both live centrally and they should live in each app. It's, it's complicated. If I'm, if I'm saying where you find your user service, the things that knows about users, I should only have to specify that once. I shouldn't have to specify that in every application because there is only one of them. Let's, keep, let's avoid duplication, just put it in one place. But at the same time, I shouldn't have to, in the central config uh, configuration, say, when you run this app, set parameter 7 to 32, because what does that even mean? That's something that only makes sense in the context of that application. Um, when I want to add a new parameter, I don't want to have to rebuild the central configuration thing to say, and I've added this new parameter, let's expose it and set values for it. So. Yeah, if you've got central configuration, every change you make is two separate commits. And 10 years down the line, when you're looking at your central configuration, you've got all these settings that you don't know if they're in use or not. If you want to actually find out what's using a setting, you've got to search every code base that you've got. It's a pain. Keeping the central configuration as small as possible is obviously a good idea. But at the same time, we don't want every setting in every app. Keeping every app's configuration as small as possible and keeping everything that's duplicated centrally is as good as possible as important as possible. And let's say you're making your application public because you think it might be useful to other people. You probably don't want any secrets in its repository. You probably want to keep the secrets somewhere else. Um, so it turns out we need both. We need local configuration. We need central configuration. We probably need some per machine settings because uh, on this machine, the large disk array is on s slash SRV, but on another machine it's not, or on this machine. Sometimes you need those things. Um, you also need information like, let's say you've got multiple production clusters. You've got one in um, Northern America and one in Europe. 
you want you need your thing your application to configure itself correctly for that cluster. There are probably very few differences, but there are going to be a couple of them. The way we've handled it is to make those all per machine settings and have them pushed down by the configuration management system. So we've ended up with this approach to configuration. Um, C means common, A or central, A means in the application. And that host name is probably a badly named thing, but it's the information specific for this machine, like its host name, its domain name, uh, where the domain that services are located at in its world. And then we've got common configuration that is all the common stuff across everywhere from local development to production. Then on top of that, you lay down con common configuration that's specific to this environment, on top of that specific to this, this cluster of this environment. Uh, then some application things. And at this point, I can show you an example of what I'm talking about. Uh, so let's get rid of one of these terminals. So here's an example app. Let's say the app was there. There isn't actually an app there, but let's say it's our graphite. And for building a graphite, we know you need you need to know where you're storing your data. We need to know where you're going to put your logs, how to find the database you're going to be talking to, what your host name is going to be. This kind of matters when you're building the hosts for your web server. And usernames and passwords. So this is the approach we've built for it. Every application goes in slash SRV slash app name. So SRV app name data is a place that this app can keep its data. And it's configured to use MySQL with no password. Probably going to override that with something else in production. But as a default, that's the same default. It's going to be graphite.something, which is the domain that you're putting all your services in. That will have come from the conf common configuration. So by the time you get to this point, we know that. And we want a password, but we don't really have it. There's no sensible default password. We want to say we need something here for this to work, but I don't know what it is. So we put this little missing value symbol. And let's give it an SSL certificate. All right. Then say we want to do local development of it. In case, if, if we're doing local development, take all of that stuff we just had and on top of it say, actually, let's put the data somewhere else in a local directory and let's make the database be SQLite. Otherwise, everything we had was good. Leave them untouched. Um, in our central, this is our centralized configuration. We've probably got something like, um, well, let's let start with, Sorry. Our services are located in example.net, our deploy wiki slash SRV. Right, that's simple enough. Um, for all the services that we're deploying, if they want to contact a graphite, they can find it at graphite.services domain on that port. And because this common file is included into every application that's deployed, they all know how to find it. Um. And in production, oh, I left out databases. You probably want some database passwords, and here's where the certificates you're going to be using can be found. Um, so we run it like so. Well, we run it. Bah. What do we say it was called? Graphite. Um, production. If we want to generate a, a production version of our graphite config, we do that. And it spits out this JSON file that has all the things that we did layered on top of each other. So it's got the super secret password, and it was MySQL, not SQLite, and it's using the sort of production storage directories. If we do that, you can see what's going on. Oh, hang on, we need a. We start with the simple thing. We, we mix in the common stuff, which was that graphite carbon section. On top of that, we add common production, which I think had the SSL certificates. On top of that, we add 
the graphite default, which had the whole graphite section. And on top of that, we add the centralized graphics, graphite thing that had graphite secrets in it, which was the super secret password. If you looked at the previous one, the password was missing value because we haven't got it yet. And if we hadn't set one, things would blow up because we let the missing value get all the way through to the end. Uh, so where were we? Somewhere here. Um, how is best to expose this configuration to applications? In Django world, you could have if ladders all over your settings.py. I mean, if you haven't built a configuration system like this, but that's horrible. Or you could have multiple settings.pys for each environment, but now every time you want to make a change, you've got to edit all of them. That's also painful. You can use environment variables, but now your environment is enormous and you need probably scripts to run your application because it's annoying, um, which is why we picked configuration files. We found that they were the neatest solution for us. Um, if you're bigger, you probably want to start going for a zookeeper or something. Yeah. If you're bigger, you know these problems. Um, I kind of touched on this already. Let's talk about deployment. You've written your code, you want to get it onto servers. Um, if you, we, co we covered this in the panel earlier. If you've got a simple application that you just want to stick on a single server, a Git checkout isn't the worst option in the world. Um, you don't want to have to build a deployment system just to deploy your one app. This is something that really annoys me, that there's no sane deployment system that we could all use. We all end up writing our own deployment systems because everything else is rubbish. Um, the downsides of this are you have to handle dependencies all by yourself. You probably have to create a virtual end by hand and get, enter it by hand and all that stuff. And you've got to write a configuration file. Blah. So if you get a little bit bigger, you're probably going to add a script that automates some of this. But so let's say your deployment process is now you SSH into a machine, you do a git pull, and then you run the script. What happens while you're doing that git pull? What happens between the git pull and the script finishing? What happens if this all goes pear-shaped? Are, are there still requests coming in? Have you rerouted requests to another machine? Now your deployment system involves talking to a load balancer and saying, don't touch this machine, I'm busy deploying to it. And then when you finish deploying, you're saying, you can send requests there now, but not there, because I want to deploy on the other machine now. At some point, you probably have to do these things, but we would really prefer not to, because it's complicated. Keep things simple. Um, this is kind of what your deployment scripts end up looking like. Yeah. Other things that go wrong when you're actually doing deployment scripts on your servers is you want to get a fix out right now, but the cheese shop is down, and you can't build virtual ends or you've deployed on half your machines and on half the other machines they couldn't talk to the cheese shop. Or someone uploaded a new version to the cheese shop while you were doing this and you hadn't pinned on exact dependencies and now different machines are running different things. That would be pretty irritating. Um, if you're doing JavaScript uh, minification or image minification and then hashing the file names so that you can put them on a CDN comfortably, if you didn't if you didn't use hash, so then you say use timestamps in those file names, maybe you'll get different timestamps on different machines, and then let's say some, a user requested a web, uh, an HTML file, they got it from one server, but then they tried to request the assets on it to get into a diff web, different web server that didn't have those exact file names, that would suck. So this is why at some point you probably want to do centralized builds rather than relying on doing building on the server that you're running the code on. It'll be reproducible. It'll have the same things everywhere. Um, this is what your build system is probably going to end up looking like. We, our build system is essentially these three steps. Building a virtual end for a Python application, or if it's not a Python application, building whatever the equivalent is, a node modules or something. Um, building anything else you have to build, like JavaScript minification. Maybe a config, but if you put config inside your built artifact, then it might then it's going to become specific to an environment, and you can't use the same artifact in both QA and production. So you might not want to do that. And then bundle it all up and somehow get it to 
machines. Um, another benefit of having done, of, of building artifacts like that is you can now roll things back. If everything goes pear-shaped, you can just go back to the previous artifact you built. You don't have to try and figure out exactly how the world was then because you have the world in a tarball or some, or a deb or something. Um, and you, instead of doing image modification on every server in your fleet, you're doing it in one place. Um, tests, obviously. Uh, of course, centralized building comes with its downsides. Um, let's say you're running multiple versions of Ubuntu and Red Hat. Um, you're going to have different versions of SS, libssl on every machine. You're going to have all sorts of other ABI incompatibilities. Um, and the longer your test script takes, the longer it's going to take in between you committing to Git and being able to deploy if you're sort of waiting for the test script to finish before you are building an artifact. Um, and you have to write build scripts. I, most of our developers don't particularly enjoy writing shell and our build scripts are shell. So they would probably consider this a, downs a downside. Um, our solution to the platform de dependencies has been to build a separate virtual env for each platform that we target. So we only target Ubuntu LTS releases, and for each LTS, we've got a Jenkins slave running on it that is building virtual envs for each. Mm -hmm. Every time there's a git commit, the Jenkins is notified. It builds a virtual env for each um, Ubuntu release for that app if the virtual env has changed. So we hash the requirements for txt and see if we need to build a new one or not. Your output if you build system is probably a tarball or a git repository or a deb or a VM if you like the Docker world or other kinds of VMs. It doesn't really matter what it is. Um, and, you, and your deployment is then as simple as extracting it, generating some config and doing something. That something is probably database migrations and notifying web servers that your code is now out there. Um, now we end up with a new kind of problem, which is every application has some build scripts and some deploy scripts, and we want to factor this out somehow. The way we've done this for deploy scripts is to centralize most of the work in the deployment system so that the applications can import the deployment system and say, um, well, I'm a Django app. I require, say, static files and database migrations. Deploy me, please. This can keep your, de your deployment scripts down to three or four lines of code and keep all the complexity in the deployment system. For build scripts, the same thing can happen. We haven't got there yet. There's still maybe 10 lines of shell in each app. Uh, next, how are we going to orchestrate our deployment. We were talking about continuous deployment, which means whenever we do a git commit deploying it, so we probably want to automate this as much as possible. Probably don't want to be SSHing into machines and manually doing stuff. Maybe you want to use a configuration management system to do this. I personally think, I'll come to that a bit more later. I think a configuration management system is useful in the bootstrapping phase and after that it should get out of the way. Um, we currently SSH into machines and run a deploy command because it's a single command really easy. We have written a web server, or will wrote a web server that um, runs on each server that you can request deploys from. So we can have a, cent a centralized coordination system that says, all the machines running this app now please deploy the to version 42, and they will do that and re report their status. Um, we haven't got around to running that yet because SSHing into a couple of machines is really easy. So your process now becomes um, some kind of commit hook, GitHub can give you these, goes to your build machine, let's say a Jenkins, and says, let's build all the things. Well, let's build that thing. Uh, you, pop, then you, you then run some tests, and there are two schools of thoughts here. Um, in the QA world, I kind of say whether the tests pass or fail, we want to deploy the thing because you committed it, and if you broke everything, you should realize how much you broke everything. Um, in production, you probably don't want to let users do that. You probably want the, those tests to restrict deploys from happening. Then we deploy, then maybe we run some validation tests that we could only run once it was deployed, which may be some Selenium testing, something like that. And then you probably want to notify in your chat 
system, let's say Slack, that the deploy has happened. Uh, releases to production, these could be Git branches, this, these could be taking a build that you've done in your QA environment and then just pushing it over to production. We're still using branches. If it's really easy to get away from that, I want to do it. Look like configuration management systems. Um, they are amazing. They have taken what sysadmins used to do by hand and let us automate it all. Um, and you can do deploys with them. Lots of people use Chef or Puppet or Ansible to deploy their code. The downside of this is if your configuration management system is doing everything it has to do to set up a server, that's probably going to take, I don't know, 15 minutes. If it, You don't want it to take 15 minutes for you to deploy some code. You want it to take two seconds to deploy some code. So I have found the best use is to use configuration management for the basic configuration, like setting up a box, bootstrapping it with all the stuff you want on it, and all the basic configuration for all your machines. And let's say we tell it this machine is going to be running this app. It's got some dependencies. Please install them. Then it can also help with service discovery. In our case, we write that configuration that goes into our configuration system that says this is where you can find services. Um, and then do an initial deploy of the application. So when the configuration management system is finished for the first time on the machine, the machine is perfectly functional. Everything is there. But after that, it's not involved in deploys anymore. Um, other things they might be useful for. We have a cool thing that I wanted to demo. Uh, what do I do with my web browsers? I keep talking about integration environments. Um, hello? The internet here is very slow. Uh, I, haven't been, I haven't been in here for a while, clearly. I'm not going to have to two-factor off, hey? No. So. Here are all the integration environments people have currently got running. Um, I can spin up a new one. Where was new? New, Stefano. I give it a name. I pick an instance size. Who cares? Um, I can tweak some other things, but normally I never need to do that. I press a button. What's now going to happen is it's going to spin up an EC2 instance, tell Chef to Chef it. And in half an hour's time, I'm going to get a notification on Slack saying, it's all done, everything's deployed. You've got an entire instance of YOLO on that machine ready to go. Um, it looks like Hank just did one half an hour, an hour ago, so I can show you what that looks like. Uh, that is the same as our... What? Um, the the left-hand side of my address bar kind of clips a couple of characters, so I'm never quite sure. You can see half the H is missing. Um, so this is our front page web app. This is the same thing, but running on an environment. I could create a user in there and go and do stuff. If the entire stack is on that machine. And I'm doing another one that's going to appear in a few minutes. So, um, um, this is something that can be incredibly useful for your developers if you can do it. We give each one of these a Jenkins, and um, you can that Jenkins receives all the Git push, Git push events, does builds, does deploys, so that each each of these machines has its own standalone world. Where if you want to make a change that go, that requires changes to three different services and two front ends, you can do that and test them all together in integration. Uh, where were we? Somewhere here. Yes. I've said this a lot. If you're trying to do continuous deployment, it means you want to get things out fast. You become aware that you're going to occasionally break stuff, and you just decide that when you do break it, you're going to fix it as quickly as possible. Um, if, you sp if you've got limited resources, why spend the effort on QA if you can pick up the problems in production and deal with them quickly. Um, that sounds bad. That's, you also want tests. GitHub calls, 
I think GitHub calls this Twitter-driven development, where you push code out to production, and if people tweet at them saying the shit's broken, then they know they have to deal with it. Um, so we want to make this as fast as possible. All the usual ways you make things fast. Um, make your machines fast. Mirror Pi Pi. In fact, we go a bit further and we build eggs. We, was, we should switch to wheels. We haven't got there yet. Um, we build eggs of all the things that are going to virtual ends, which means we can build a virtual end in a matter of seconds. Um, then even those, those virtual ends we cache as well, which you can extract in one second, probably, well, download and extract probably in one second. Um, try to get your image modification done in advance. Don't waste time on it during builds. Try to get your slow tests out of the build system uh, pipeline and maybe do them separately. And I would say don't build VMs because that's just going to take longer. Um, if you have if you have long-lived machines, you can push code out faster. So I've spoken a bit about our deployment tool. Yeah, it it builds tables. We could have done devs. The reason we chose to spit out tables was so that we can extract them side by side on production machines, which means if we want to roll back, it's as simple as switching a symlink from pointing at that one to pointing at the one we last had, which can make rollbacks very, very fast. Um, yeah, so when you deploy an app, it goes to serve app version name, and then there's a serve app live symlink that points at the live one of those. Um, the deployment process is something like extract, extract dependencies, um, do things like write configuration files, then swing the, the live symlink and notify things that need to be notified that the deploy has happened. Uh, it's, no, your configurator is tied deeply into it. It's got a really simple templating engine, um, uh, Tempeter, which we use to generate vhost configs. It knows that Python applications have virtual ends and that it should get the right virtual end for this application. We must still do the same for NPM, but actually we don't have many NPM apps in production. We keep it all to build time. Um, it knows all the things. So what we then try to do is, I remember I was asking earlier what happens while you're deploying, what happens to your code, what happens when a web server comes in. In the ideal world, you want the web server to finish handling current requests with the old code and then start using the new code for new requests and never drop any requests onto the floor. Um, some languages make this easy. Uh, we've had yeah, no problem with um, our open RESTy apps with that. Static HTML is still pretty easy. Um, you've got to think about things like hashing, but those are normal problems you've got if you're running a static app. Mod we use ModWhiskey because it does this for us. On the downside, it misses a request or two every time, and we think that's fine. Why go to the effort of building a really complex replacement if you can just do a retry of a request every now and then? Um, if we were to use another system, I think what we'd have to do is, say, have a unicorn worker listening on port 8001, and another one listening on 8002 that gets the new version of the code, then you tell the, a load balancer to use that one, not the old one, and then you can take the old one down. It's annoyingly complicated. Um, Java, Tomcat supports this through panel rail deployments, but after you've deployed a few times to Tomcat, it falls over because it runs out of permgen space. Um, or it uses 100% CPU rather than actually falling over, which would be more useful. Uh, for our code, we would need to improve our build time still. And we need to get to a single deploy button rather than having people SSH into machines and run deploy commands by hand. We want, we want to have a de deployment dashboard that has all of these things and the graphs that go with each application. Yeah, there's some work I need to do. I think I've covered enough. Do you have questions? <laughs> Okay, thank you, Stefano. So, any questions? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's, there's one at the back.
Just, just remember the key. Hi, James. Are you going to speak? OK. <laughs> Is this better? Yes. OK, so the biggest thing we struggle with during a deploy is we have all these sort of long running tasks, um, things feeding off a salary queue. Yep. And then you get to the stage where you've got messages sitting on the queue from older code and then you switch the workers out and they potentially want a different message format or different arguments for your task, something like that. Is it something you've faced and what these would you do? These aren't problems we've dealt with yet. Um, We've been very careful in the API design of any asynchronous jobs. Maybe we don't use asynchronous queues enough yet. Um, the what, you can, what is important is you don't have to always deploy the new code to all the machines at the same time if you design your APIs carefully. For front-end stuff, you often do have to, but for services, if you don't have anything calling new functions yet, maybe you don't. Maybe you can deploy one machine, let it take, start all the workers on there, let the other ones wind down when they finish their work, and deploy on them later. Especially for asynchronous jobs, if you stop everything for a while, the world doesn't come to an end. You can pick them up in an hour's time, but that doesn't really help your API problems. Careful design. Okay. So an interesting problem I normally face with automating deployments and doing continuous deployments is uh, you start doing it faster than a human can keep up with. And always the problem is uh, how do you know you just broke something and which thing broke it at the time of the continuous deployment? How did you solve that problem? By being a small company. <laughs> um, <laughs> we've only got 15 engineers. Any given app probably isn't going to get deployed more than three times in one day. Um, okay. Do you, I mean, do, you, do you keep an eye on metrics or something? Or <sighs> um, Yes, we graph all the things. Um, <laughs> and in our graphite graphs, we sent every deploy event to the graphs. We could draw pretty lines on them, but we never actually built a dashboard for the graphs. So <laughs> I, I, I guess a, a, a next step is like adding threshold to those graphs and having it yeah. fire alerts. And yes, so I mean, we have alerting. We have... When your company's at the side, oh, I am probably the only person at the company that's able to follow everything that's going on. I don't think anyone else tries. Um, but when you can follow everything that's going on, it's easy to say, well, obviously that thing's responsible for that breakage. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, what, what, we, what we do do is whenever someone releases some code, we create a GitHub ticket that the support team can see that says these are the things that got, these are the commits that got released. And when something goes wrong, you can go and look at that at that archive of release reports and say, well, about the same time this went wrong is when that deploy happened. Oh, okay, I guess those are correlated. Let's go and look at the diff and see what, what the yeah. cause was. Uh, yeah, your, your situation sounds familiar to what I'm used to at the moment. Yeah. Um, but we're trying to find out what's the like future of that. It, not such a big problem for us yet. Okay, no, I... Maybe uh, we need I, to grow. I got bored of that work. I want, I want a computer to do it for me. <laughs> Thanks, Kitty. Well, if you find out in the next year, please come back next year and <laughs> tell us how to solve it. Um, any other questions? If there aren't, then it, I think it is time for tea. So um, let's thank Stefano again for his talk. I hope that wasn't too wordy. <laughs>